Uh, well, it's my pleasure to be with you uh, today and uh, these next few days for those of you who are coming. Um, but let's pray and ask God to help us as we uh, read his word and study it together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have said that your word is living and active, sharper than any sword, and that it penetrates to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. You've also said in your word that you have made it able to judge the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. So I pray for myself and for us today. Please enable me to speak your word faithfully and please cause it to do what you have promised it will. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen. Uh, friends, uh, I want to start this first talk today uh, with a small task for you to do. Um, I want you to imagine that you have received a letter from a lawyer and uh, that this lawyer has told you that you are the beneficiary of someone's will. Um, and uh, the amount that you have been left is $100,000. Okay? Now, the only trick is that you are not allowed to use it for yourself. So, you must give it away. And you must give it away to five different organisations or individuals, okay? But we'll say organisations will make it easy. Um, or you can give it away to causes, but you must give it away to five separate organisations or causes. Uh, all is re that re is required of you is that you let the lawyer know who you're giving it to and how much. You can proportion it differently if you like. Now, in the uh, outline you have in front of you, you see there's a place where you can write down how much you want to give to each person. Now, you don't have to write down, it's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, you don't even have to show it to anyone else. But I want you to imagine in your mind you've got $100,000 you have to give away to five different organisations. And I'm going to give you a minute to think about it and to think how much you would give to what. Okay, just a minute, just think about it for a moment. Uh, and then if you want to, you can write it down, but you don't have to. Just put it in your mind. See the outline, I've just said how much to what organisation or whatever. 30 seconds left. Okay, I'm going to pretend, hopefully, that you will not pretend that you have actually done this in your brain now, okay, or on paper. Now I want you to forget about it for the moment. We will come back to it at the end. Okay? Now, having made this start, let me give you the briefest outline of Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. You might like to follow in your Bibles with me. In Acts chapter, or sorry, um, Acts chapter 11, uh, Acts chapter 1, 1 to 4, I want to remind you that Acts is the second volume of a two-volume work. The first volume is Luke's Gospel. And the words in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, reflect, reflect the language that was there back in Luke's Gospel and that began Luke's Gospel. It also tells us what happened in volume 1, Luke's Gospel. Verses 1 to 2 give us a brief summary of Luke's Gospel. They tell us that volume 1, Luke's Gospel, was about what Jesus began to do and teach. By implication, volume 2 will tell us what Jesus continued to do and teach. Once Luke has told us this, he then sets the scene for volume 2. Now we're going to spend a bit of time in Acts in this next few days, but I want you to see what he does. What Luke does here is he emphasises three things. He emphasises the commandments that Jesus gave to his disciples, and he emphasises the reality of the resurrection appearance of Jesus, and he emphasises the promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit. These are very important things to emphasise. 
You see, these things are the foundation of the continuing work of the followers of Jesus. It's these things that mean their work is, con is, is the continuation of the work of the founder of the church, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to do some more imagining. I've already got you to do some imagining with uh, money to spend. But I want you to do some more imagining. I want you to imagine for a moment you are one of the disciples of Jesus. If you were, you would be a good Jew. Okay? And if you were a good Jew, then you would have thought of the flow of God's saving history something like the diagram I've given you in your outline. That is, and you would have thought something like this. You would have thought God created the world. Uh, then he had a time when the Messiah would come, and then after that would be the next world, as it were. If you were a disciple of Jesus, you would have watched Jesus over the three years. And it would have gradually become, you would have gradually become aware that Jesus really was the Messiah. And once having realized this, the question that you would have in your mind would be this. It would be. So if Jesus has arrived, then is it now time you restored the kingdom? Because you would have thought in your brain, coming of the Messiah means coming of the kingdom means the end of the world and life under the rule of God. And so what would be the question that you asked when you saw Jesus alive? You would say to him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That would be your big question. If Jesus is the Messiah, the kingdom has come, the kingdom will return, everything will be set. In other words, they're saying something like this. Jesus, we know you are the Messiah. You continually preach to us about the kingdom of God coming. And we know you are the king of that kingdom, the Messiah. And we know you have come to bring the rule of God over God's people. Everything that is needed has now happened. So is now the time. Are you going to wrap up and complete the purposes of God? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to bring the world together under the rule of the Messiah, you, the Christ? That's what I think is going on in the brains of the disciples here this day. And now I want you to look at the answer Jesus gives them. It's fascinating. Have a closer look and notice some of the things about what he said. First, I want you to notice the answer Jesus gives because it's a non-answer. It's not really the answer they wanted and it's a sort of non-answer. Jesus says this, It is not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. In other words, I think it's sort of Jesus is saying, None of your business. Okay? None of your business. And uh, I find it quite intriguing, that answer. You know, well, I don't know if you noticed this, but when you hear Jesus answering questions throughout his ministry, do you notice that sometimes when he answers, it's not quite the answer that you expect? And that's true here as well. Jesus is not giving the answer you expect. Can you see, though, what Jesus is doing? He's saying, you've got the wrong question. He's making clear that the question about when, the timing of it, is not the important question. No, the important question is not when, but what. Okay, not when, but what. The important question is not this. When are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? No, rather the important question is, what do you want us to do while, uh, while we wait for you to restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, not when is it, but what do you want us to do while we wait? And that, I think, is the question that Jesus answers. He tells them that they must understand what it is they are to be doing. Their task, you see, in this new era of history, post the coming of the Messiah, is to act as witnesses to him. They are to tell the world what they have learnt and what they know. They are to witness to him, Jesus says, from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. This is how God's kingdom will spread, through the witness of the disciples of Jesus. And then he tells them how they'll be able to accomplish this task. They will do so with help. 
For he will send the Holy Spirit, who will empower them for this task of being his witnesses from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. So what he's saying is, don't stand gazing up into heaven. Perhaps uh, you're like me. You've never quite understood what verses 9 to 11 are about. Have a look at them there. Let me make a suggestion as to what I think is going on in verses 9 to 11. They are a reminder to the disciples about the impact of what Jesus has said. You see, in verse 9, Jesus is taken up from his disciples. He ascends. And uh, in verse 10, you can see what they do. They stand looking from where, as to where he's gone, longing for him to come back, longing for his return. Their unspoken prayer is met by the appearance of two men. And these two men explain what is going on. And they explain why the disciples are gazing into heaven. And the point of the encounter is clear. What's being said is this. They say to them, why are you standing here, staring into heaven? You've got your orders. They've just been given to you. Get on with your job. Jesus will return at the right time. And he'll come back just as he has ascended into heaven. In other words, what they're saying is, Jesus will return, so get on with your job. And do it before he comes back. Because that's what he's waiting for. So let me try and sum up these few verses in another diagram. You can see the diagram in front of you. What Jesus is doing is he's letting them know that they must change their Jewish view of God's saving history and transform it into a Christian view. What, what I think Jesus is doing is he's putting a split in history. Remember what their view would have been? Their view would have been creation of the world, forming of God's people, the coming of the Messiah, the kingdom of God. What Jesus is doing is saying, hang on a moment, I want to put a split in history. The split in history goes this way. Creation of the world, the coming of the Christ, a gap, and the end, when the kingdom comes in all its glory. So there's my revised diagram. But you can see there that in between, there is a goal for the people of God. So in that time from creation to coming of the Messiah to the coming of the kingdom in all its glory, there is something to be done. There is a task to be entered into. The coming of the Spirit will enable the fulfilling of the true task of Israel. Now I think this is very interesting, isn't it? We are so used to interpreting these verses in Acts in one way that we miss the most important point. You see, we think these verses are about the power of the Spirit. That is not what they're about at all. No, the priority is not on the coming of the Spirit. The priority is on the task that God's people are to do by the power of the Spirit. And that is to witness to Jesus. You see, the priority of these verses is on witness. Jesus is giving a job description to the church, to the representatives of his people. Like Israel in Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6, the disciples are to be God's servants, to restore the tribes of Judah and to bring back those of Israel God has kept for himself. As Isaiah says, they are to be made a light to the nations in order to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I think this passage is plain. Jesus is putting a split in history. He is saying that God is holding back the day of judgment. God is holding back the day when He'll wind up history and create a new heavens and a new earth. God is giving a time in which His people may enter the kingdom, in which people may enter the kingdom and escape the judgment that's going to come at the end. And in that split in history, Jesus is giving the people of God a job description. Their job description between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus is to witness to Him. These verses, I think, are therefore the equivalent of Matthew 24, verse 14, where Jesus says, The gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world 
as, to, as a testimony to the nations, and then shall the end come. And all of this means that these verses are not for an isolated group of people because those 12 disciples, those 11 disciples, they've long gone to be with their Lord, haven't they? But we are still here. We are still here. These verses are for us because we're still between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, aren't we? And he is saying that God has a purpose for us. That purpose is to bring into existence a people for himself. But more than that, his purpose is a purpose for us. Our goal is to be God's spirit-filled people between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus. And our task between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus is essentially that of evangelism or mission. It is to reach the world for Jesus Christ. So Acts, no, Acts 1 is not an isolated passage in the Bible. It is repeated time and time and time again. And we could have a look at a few more passages. And as we do, you'll see that this command given to these disciples in Acts 1 is given to them as our representatives. Their God-given task is our God-given task. Their job description is our job description. By the way, I should say here that there are some people who differ with me about how to interpret this passage. There are some who say that being a witness is about being a witness to the resurrection. There are some who think this task is the task of just the twelve or the eleven. And passages like the one at the end of Acts 1 should, could offer some support for that. The death of Jesus um, after the death of Jesus, they seek to appoint someone to fill the gap. Do you remember after the death of Jesus, they say, we've got to find another, uh, another apostle, another disciple. And they, but, not, but when they do, do you notice what they say? It must be someone who's seen things from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. But I think restricting ministry to just the twelve is not what this passage says. I think it gives you to the apostles as representatives of us. And uh, I think we inherit what the job description that was given to the twelve. Anyway, with that in mind, let's move on. And I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. The Apostle Peter and John are arrested for speaking about Jesus. They are quizzed by the religious authorities. And in verse 18 of chapter 4, if you have a look at it, the religious authorities, Authorities order them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. And I want you to take special note of how the apostles respond. Look at verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter 4, 19 and 20. Notice the word use of the words listen to you. That is, they're saying they have a choice. They can listen to what they're being told by the religious authorities, or they can listen to God. Now, I can find in this passage where the religious authorities command the disciples to do something. Can you see it there? They say, don't preach. That's verse 18. But I cannot find anywhere in this passage where God has told them something. I think it's because God told them way back in Acts chapter 1. And this is because God's word to them is there. And they live under that word. The thing God says to them is, I think, the command of Acts chapter 1, verses 7 to 8. This command has now become foundational in their lives. It's what they do all the time. Acts 1, 7 and 8 now colours their whole approach to life. They are now under the command of God to speak about Jesus Christ. And so the word listen to in Acts 4 doesn't have general reference. It's specific. God has given his people a command. It's a command to witness to Jesus Christ. And when human beings give them the opposite command, what should you do? If you've got a command from God and a command from human beings, what should you do? Listen to the command from God. You should proclaim his son. And the uh, second thing I want you to notice is what motivates the apostles to speak about Jesus. You notice that? Look at verse 21. The disciples say, 
For we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. Now I take it that those are the marks of someone who's come to really know and understand who Jesus is. See, a person who knows Jesus, a person who understands who Jesus is, is a person who cannot but help, help but speak about Jesus. You see, they are under a command, aren't they? Acts chapter 1. But that's not their primary motivation. Their primary motivation is that they, having come to know Jesus, they cannot help but speak about him. They cannot help but speak about him. I want you to flip over to Acts chapter 5 now. The preaching and healing ministry of uh, the apostles again begins to cause some religious, some friction with the religious leaders. And so the apostles are arrested again. They're released by an angel. They go on preaching in Acts chapter 5. They're arrested again. And the high priest reminds them that he had ordered them not to preach in the name of Jesus. Verse 28, chapter 5. And the apostles respond in verses 29 to 32. Look at what they say. The apostles state even more clearly what they would said before. They must obey God rather than human authorities. Then they give a short, short gospel presentation, verses 30 to 31. And finally they explain their reasons for preaching in verse 32. Look at verse 32. Look at what they say their job is. They are to be witnesses to these things. Look at what they say the Holy Spirit's job is. The Holy Spirit's job is to witness to the same things. And look at who they say the Holy Spirit is given to. He is given to those who obey Him. Presumably the obedience here is the same obedience that's referred to in verse 29. That is obeying God's command to witness. So. I take it that the reference to the Holy Spirit being given here is not the receiving the Spirit for the first time. No, it's a reference to being filled with the Spirit in a special way. To do, to do what task do you think? It's to tell the world about the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. I think the implication of this verse is profound. God is speaking to us. He's making something very clear to us. And he's saying the process, and the process is not the one you normally would think. You see, we normally think, don't we? We will wait around for God to give us power, and then we'll get on with the job he has given us to be his witnesses. Don't we often think that way? And don't people often speak that way? But that's not what's being said here. The process here is very different. It goes like this. You already have the Spirit because you're Christian. You also have a job description because you're Christian to be a witness to Jesus. Therefore, obey God by witnessing to Him. And then God will do His part through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's job between the first coming of Jesus and the second is what? To be a witness to Jesus Christ. Now I think we know this from experience, don't you? Have you ever had this? And that when we actually get on with telling people about Jesus, have you noticed that sometimes the words are given to you? And that sometimes you're able to say things you would never have thought of beforehand. And what's that? That is God giving His words to us. Using the Spirit to convict. Now, I want to show you that there's, uh, this fits with what's said elsewhere in the New Testament as well. In your Bibles, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul addresses the question of whether Christians should eat food that is offered to idols. He spends three chapters on that particular issue. Then in chapter 10, verses 31 to chapter 11, verse 1, he concludes his argument. And I want you to look at what he says. As I read them, I want you to ask yourself, how do I follow the example of Paul as he follows the example of Jesus Christ? How do I follow the example of Paul as he follows the example of Jesus Christ? Well, let's read it and see what it says. I'm reading from a slightly different version, but it'll be close to yours. Paul says, 
So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offence to Jews or Greeks or the Church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I don't know if you know, but the chapters and the verses of the New Testament were not part of the original. They were all added somewhere in medieval times. 11th, 10th or 11th century. So there were originally no chapters and no verse breaks. And that's one of the great pities is when people were putting in the verse breaks, I think, and the chapter breaks, they made some big mistakes. Imagine that you had just chapter 11, as a, a verse 1, as a new paragraph. And you cut it loose from the previous chapter. You wouldn't understand what is being said, would you? You just think it's a command to be imitators of Christ. Or of Paul, as he's an imitator of Christ. But actually, look back and you'll see what they are to imitate. You see, you follow Paul as he follows Jesus when you seek the good of many so that they might be saved. That's how you are imitators of Jesus. When you seek the good of many so that they may be saved. And it makes sense, doesn't it? After all, Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says that. What did Jesus come for? To seek and to save the lost. And it's that, that where Paul most closely imitates his Lord. You see, he too is committed, committed to seeking and saving the lost. That's what makes Paul function as a human being. He expects that this is what will make the Corinthians function. He expects that this will make us function. We will want to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save the lost. We we'll want to be like Jesus. We we'll want to be like his Apostle Paul who did the same. Our whole motivation in life should be the glory of God. God is glorified most when his Son is proclaimed. God is glorified most when his Son is proclaimed. God is glorified when people are saved through the words about Jesus Christ. Now friends, I could go to many other passages in the New Testament, but it's time we return to Acts chapter 1. So flip back to Acts 1 and let's have a look. There's something of a problem with what is said in Acts 1, isn't there? I wonder if you noticed it. The problem is that 19 centuries or 20 centuries have now rolled by since those first words were said. Those words were proclaimed. And we're still waiting, aren't we? We're still waiting. The kingdom is still not consummated. Jesus hasn't returned yet. The heavenly clock is still ticking on. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, second by second, as it were. Hour by hour, day by day, year by year. Century by century is heading for its goal. But this passage still speaks to us. It says that in one way we are still in the positions those first disciples found themselves in. We are still waiting for the end. But while we wait, we are not to be staring into the sky waiting. We're to be getting on with the job that God gave us. We have much more important things to be concerned about than when Jesus comes back. We've got a job to get on with. It's as though we are in extra time. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about a strange form of football that we play in Australia. Okay? It's called Australian Rules, and it's got all sorts of weird rules. Right? But one rule is this. So instead of having two halves like soccer or normal football, there are four sections, okay? There are four parts, four quarters. And in every quarter, it goes for 25 minutes. But then what they do is they add time for all the time that the ball has been off the field. Okay? And no one knows how much of that time there is. And you collect it from all four quarters. 
Okay, and so you get to 4 by 25 periods, and then you've got extra time, and none of the players know how much is there in extra time. So the bell could go off any time, okay? So what are you going to do once you get past the four quarters? You're going to kick as many goals as you can in the time remaining. Is that right? And that's what they do. They try Whatever you do, get it off the other opponent and kick goals. If I can put it this way, we are into that time now. Not in this world. We're in those last moments. And our job in this last time, because the Messiah has come, so we're into extra time. We don't know when that extra time is going to finish. And our job in that time is to keep goals for Jesus. And how do we do that? By telling the world about Him. Now, that is, I think, to be our consuming passion in this period of time. But there's another point to make from Acts chapter 1. I want you to think about the people you hear about in this chapter. Who are they? Just think about all of those disciples you know, those 12 disciples. Think about their background. What sort of background did they have? Well, they were fishermen, weren't they? They were tax collectors. They were zealots. They are revolutionaries. They were just ordinary people. They were all the sorts of people that populated the world in that period of time. And what do they do when they hear of God's strategy for them? What do they do? Well, they understand it. And they realise there's one important thing to happen now. They recognise that everything else is insignificant because there's a one important thing to happen. Only one thing is really important now. And it's so important, so urgent, that it demands a radical life change. It demands that they put down their nets again. But that they stop being fishermen of fish. No, that they stop even being tax collectors and zealots. You see, their priority now is to evangelise the world tell the world about Jesus Christ. They stop being ordinary people with ordinary pursuits in some ways. They become gospel people. Oh, that's not that you can't do an ordinary job any longer, but your priority is to be a gospel person. They must give their lives to being gospel people. From now on, they will be people who give their whole lives over to the purpose of beating the clock by becoming evangelists. People who are determined that all they are and all they have will be given over to ensuring that as many people are in the kingdom when the alarm goes off at the end. Now friends, if I might say to you and to myself, these ordinary people are not alone. These fishermen, these zealots, these tax collectors. Throughout history, there have been people, gospel people, that is, people who have been grasped by the gospel of Jesus Christ, just like these. And we too have been grasped by the gospel of Jesus Christ, haven't we? For we know, don't we, if you are a Christian, then you know that in Jesus you have found something more important than everything else in life. For we've, we've met God's Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And meeting him puts a question mark over everything we ever thought was important. There's really, in the end, for a Christian, only one important thing now. God is calling us to join the disciples and to throw away every other priority we have for one important priority. It's not that we stop doing everything else. It's that it, start, it stands under one overarching priority to be a witness to Jesus, to imitate God's Son, whose whole aim in life was to seek and to save the lost. Let me put it to you quite starkly. The call of Jesus in these verses, I think, is a very radical call. It's saying, look, 
If you're Christian, you're not like the rest of the world. If you're Christian, you're not like the rest of the world. You actually have a greater priority than everything else. See, everyone else around you says, oh, it's got to be career first, or family first, or partner first, or mortgage first, or security first, or um, promotion first, or... No, he says, no, actually, your priority as a Christian is to testify to Jesus Christ first. To put him as your place in priority. And you do that in your use of your time, your study, your relationships, your money. But I don't think it's right to stop there. After all, let me tell you that my experience so far in Singapore has been that the church in Singapore is rich. It is rich. And it's full of gifted men and women. I've met remarkable people in the church in Singapore in the last 15 months that I've been here. I've been coming to Singapore off and on for 15 years. And I know that the church in Singapore is full of very able and gifted people. And I can't help think, therefore, that there might be an extra word for us here. You see, we are amongst, in many ways, you might think this, but it is true. You are amongst, we are amongst, the most spoiled Christians in the world. We live in a place where we can worship Christ freely. And the church in Singapore has a noble and rich heritage. Many come from churches that have taught well over many years. Now, and I know many people in the church in Singapore are very gifted in ministry. I've seen some of them in action. But most importantly, we know Jesus, don't we? We know Jesus. And we know God's purpose in His world. And my feeling is that some of us, though, still hold back a little bit, don't we? Or, if I could put it another way, we still hold Jesus' rule over our life just a little bit distant from us. We don't like Jesus getting too close. But we do know God's purpose for in His world, don't we? And I think some of us just hold it off a little bit. We know that God calls us to throw away every other priority for the greater priority of making Jesus known. That He calls us to be His witness. We've seen it in our passage today. To be evangelists, even as He's an evangelist. To imitate His Son, whose whole aim in life was to seek and to save the lost. But some of us don't take it as seriously as we could. And some really let, allow, need to allow God to challenge us a bit in this area. And for some, this will be costly in terms of life choices or money or career or whatever. But I, will, I want to urge you to consider how you might give up your small ambitions in order to spend your time and energy on God's great purpose. There are lots of ways you can do it. But its chief focus is to tell other people about Jesus. That's what God the Father is doing today. And that's what God the Son is died for. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world today. Telling people about Jesus. Remember? Remember what Paul said? Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Now before I finish, let's begin going to the $100,000 you had to spend. <laughs> Go back to the hundred thousand dollars. Can you remember how you allocated it? Let me say that a good way to work out your priorities is to see how you spend your money. Right. You see, one friend who took me on as a disciple, as to mentor me when I was young, said, "When this has been converted, Andrew, you're being converted. <laughs> when this has been converted, or your purse." then you have been converted. That's when you see whether the gospel has really touched your existence, when it affects the way you use your money. So, perhaps some of you did spend the majority of that money on gospel ministry, on gospel proclamation. But if you didn't, could I urge you to do some rethinking about life? 
maybe you haven't yet fully grasped the impact of the gospel on you. The gospel of God's Son. Maybe you haven't yet let the gospel filter down into your life as fully as it ought to. Maybe you need to do some work on understanding what God is about in His world. Maybe you need to change your understanding into action and change lifestyle. You see, that's what God calls us to do, is to change our lives according to what He's done in His Son. And that will affect every corner of our existence. And at the heart of it, is mission. That is making Christ known. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son into the world. Thank you that he died so that people might be forgiven. Thank you, Father, that he sits at your right hand now and that one day he will return again. Father, we pray that in between that time when he left and the time when he returns to rule, you would help us to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever ways we can, so that when he returns, there may be even more people to greet him. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.